Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Tent of Abraham. I'm Tamir Kreisman from Jerusalem, Israel, and we continue with Pirke de Rebeliezer. So we are in chapter 47. This is 47e. This is the final section of chapter 47. And we'll start with some Tehilim. Hallelujah et Adonai kol goim, shabuchu kol haumim, ki gavar alenu chasdo ve'emet Adonai l'olam. Hallelujah. This class is called, We Don't Negotiate with Terrorists. Because we don't. Well, we shouldn't. Rabbi Pinchas says, The Holy One, blessed be he, said to Moses, Do you remember what the Midianites did to you? When they caused 24,000 of Israel to fall? It's the same thing like when we discuss with Amalek. Why does God say, remember what Amalek did to you? In other words, referring to the punishments, to what they actually did, not exactly referring to what brought that about, right? The whole sexual immorality and, and idolatry and, and whatnot. But rather, before you die, God tells Moses, you will take vengeance upon them, as said in Numbers 31.2. Take revenge for the children of Israel against the Midianites. Afterwards, you will, be, you will be gathered to your people. Whenever a debt isn't paid, the world remains in an imbalance. It causes problems, right? That's why to establish a, a courts for yourself, courts of justice for yourself, this is obviously we have, uh, we have uh, Jewish courts according to Jewish law and also in the rest of the world, according to the Noahides, also have to establish courts for themselves. Once the court system is corrupt, which, come on, it's already a joke at this point, we know this, the whole thing falls apart because there's so much imbalance and injustice and it starts eating the world from within. So, case in point. So obviously, depending on the seriousness of the debt, there are different levels of sin, of course. For instance, there is a chatat, a chet, which is an accident, a mistake, um, if you're firing a gun and you miss your target, it's called lehachti, chet. To, you, you missed the mark. It wasn't on purpose. It was an accident. Like, okay, you were off. The second is avon, knowing something is wrong, but doing it anyway. In other words, I, I know I shouldn't turn that light on on Shabbat, but I, it's dark in here. So whatever, right? Knowing that. And then there is pesha. Pesha is... A crime in modern day Hebrew, poshe is a criminal. So there's pesha. It is a willful sin to specifically defy God. I know I shouldn't be doing this, and I'm gonna do it anyway. Ha <laughs> ha ha! There you go. It's like that. These are differences, right? So all can be atoned for in one way or another. But when it comes to the three cardinal sins, which is blood, uh, bloodshed, idolatry, and sexual immorality, so long as they are not atoned for, so long as the situation has not been made whole, it is like leaving the window open while a swarm of bees is coming at you. No problem. And it's, it's going to happen. The Radal says... This command to take vengeance came immediately after the transgression took place and the 24,000 were killed, right? 24,000, boom, God said, go take vengeance on them right away. Why? Why? Check this out. Because things tend to be forgotten or not get done due to laziness. That's why God says, remember what they did? Remember what Amalek did? Okay. So case in point, hear me now. People seem to forget how they were um, uh, how they were right after October seventh last year already, right? We I could tell you we wanted blood. The world was still in shock. We were in shock, but we wanted blood. We saw it there. Wait a minute, the the blood was warm on the ground, right? We forgot that it wasn't only the Hamas militants that crossed the fence and raped and tortured and murdered and pillaged our men, women, and children, right? They showed us. There were hundreds, if not thousands, of your average everyday Gazans as well. In all the videos, in their videos, dudes with shorts and flip-flops running into the homes, breaking, stealing, beating, Regular Gazans, right? The, the innocent, the ones where... And what about after they brought the living and the dead of ours back to Gaza? It was the old women and the young children who were beating the bodies with sticks and with pipes, cursing at them and spitting on them. Everyone is guilty. 
We forget that Hamas was elected by the Gazans to be their government, and every last Gazan is guilty. Now, I'm not even speaking of the world and what they are saying about Israel's atrocities, right? Because we know that they have no future. How could you do? Are you kidding right now? In no other place, in no other country, would you ever turn on the people that got that kind of hit and say, it's your fault? Kind of blaming the victim over there, right? Straight up. Okay. So let them say what they want. Like we said, they have no future. All this stuff is written. Lines are being drawn. We are seeing very clearly who's going to live and really who's going to wish they were dead. So I'm talking about our own people who have been burning down our country to, you know, for the sake of brokering a deal for the hostages while all these things are going down. Who do you think you're dealing with here? One of the main reasons this event was even possible was because of the last deal that the same prime minister made with Hamas, right? Releasing 1,000, 1,100, 1,200 murderers who actually killed Jews, letting them go free. Amongst them, Sinwar. Is he dead now? Sure, whatever, maybe, maybe not. Who cares? It doesn't matter. Another one will pop up. We see. So... They made a deal with Hamas, and now this continued, and because of that, this last thing last year happened. So there's no way to go about this. We're talking scorched earth over here, as painful as it is to say. It is not painful to say. They know the value that we have on life, and we know the value that they have on death. They will throw their children off the roofs to say, look, the Zionists did it. Crazy. And we'll talk about that too, don't worry. It was a very simple, swift, and biblical solution. This is how you handle this. And here's your source. King David himself, please turn to 1 Samuel chapter 30. You got you want hostage, hostage, uh, hostage negotiations? You got it right there. We're going to read a few of these verses over here, and I'll, you know, but feel free to read the chapter. Verse 1, And it was when David and his men came to Ziklag, that on the third day the Amalekites had raided the south of Ziklag, and they had smote Ziklag and burnt it with fire. And they had captured the women who were therein, but they slew no one, neither big nor small, but let them but led them away and went on their way. In other words, they kidnapped everybody, all the women and all the children. And David and his men came to the city, and behold, it was burned with fire, and their wives and their sons and their daughters had been captured. Oh, look, we have Amalekites crossing the border and kidnapping the women and the children. I mean, some things never change, right? What do you think David and his men did? Did they try to negotiate? The first thing was to take responsibility. Verse 4, And David and all the people who were with him raised their voice and wept until they had no strength to weep. In other words, a tragedy just happened. It's on our shoulders because it did happen. Next, and just to make it personal for David, and David's two wives were captured, Achinoam the Jezreelitis, Jezreelitis, from Israel, for goodness sakes, how they translate, and Abigail, the wife of Nabal the Carmelite. They weren't scared, they were angry. And they used that anger. They used that focus. It was fresh, right? So they were focused because they knew you do not negotiate with Amalek. Who are Amalek? Anybody that can do what Amalek did. Anybody that can do what these Gazans did. You don't speak to them. We don't speak the same language. What did Amalek do? In the beginning, remember what Amalek did to you. All the, where it got all the stragglers from the rear. What did they do? They, they took primarily the, the tribe of Dan, the, the males from the tribe of Dan, and they cut off their thing, right? They cut off their Brit, and they took their Brit, and they threw it up to the heavens, and they said, here, God, here's your covenant. Take it back. The only, the only group of people that I've seen do this, like in the last hundred years, Hamas, Fatah, Hezbollah, you know, Arafat, his, uh, the uh, 72 Olympics in Munich, that's exactly what they did. And now again, they did it, mutilating bodies. This is Amalek straight up. There's their signature, taking the time to torture. I mean, in very, very creative and disgusting ways. 
So you don't negotiate with them, right? Because we don't negotiate with terrorists. And he brought them down, meaning they found, a, as they were approaching to get them back, they found a, an Egyptian who fled, a, an Egyptian slave who fled from the Amalekites. And then they said, show me where they're at. So they brought them down and behold, they were scattered over an entire landscape, eating and drinking and dancing because of all the great spoil which they had taken from the land of the Philistines and from the land of Judah. And David smote them. Okay, in other words, you have all our women and children, and you guys are partying, and yay, right? No problem. Okay, and David smote them from evening until evening to their morrow, and no man of them escaped except 400 young men who rode on camels and fled. And David rescued all that the Amalekites had taken, and David rescued his two wives. In other words, no hostages were killed. No nothing. No problem. No problem. No problem here. And there was nothing missing to them, neither small nor great, their, nor their sons, nor their daughters, nor anything which had they had taken for themselves. David recovered everything. Wow. Where are our leaders? Where are our kings? I'm not talking about self-appointed kings, of course. The face of the generation, like we said, is its leader. And we have some ugly leaders. So, coming back to our text. God told Moses immediately after the transgressions and the deaths to take vengeance upon the Midianites for what they did to Israel. I hope you understand, like everything we are seeing, this has happened before. This is how you handle it successfully. What is happening today is a complete and total failure. You must understand this. It is not biblical. And we're going to discuss exactly how to do it according to the five books of Moses. So what did Moses do? He took a thousand men from each and every tribe. So there were 12,000. And I just want to point out that our sages uh, say about the actual verse in the Torah from Numbers 31, 4. A thousand for each tribe, a thousand for each tribe. From all the tribes of Israel, you shall send into the army. So the question is, why does it say a thousand for each tribe? Two times, right? A thousand for each tribe, a thousand for each tribe. That should be 24,000. So one understanding is that, in fact, they did take 24,000 from each tribe for the 24,000 fallen from, uh, from Israel, from the tribe of Shimon. But the next verse sets the record straight. From the thousands of Israel, 1,000 was given over for each tribe, 12,000 armed for battle. So, in fact, it was 12,000 and not 24,000. So what's the answer? Why does it say it twice? As we've learned, as above, so below. Always. Spiritual, physical. Always. Just like there are 12 tribes in the physical world, there are 12 tribes of Israel in the spiritual world. The hint towards this is from Psalms 122. So we'll start with 3 and 4. The built-up Jerusalem is like the city that was joined together within itself. Jerusalem, Jerusalem. They have to be joined together. There ascended the tribes, down here, the tribes of Yah, up there. Testimony to Israel to give thanks to the name of the Lord. So there's two Jerusalems with to, uh, to, to be joined together, as well as the tribes of Yah, which signify the upper worlds, right? Why, why does it, like, you know, people like, they like to say Yah. Yud and He and the letters Vav and the letter He. This is a four-letter name of God. Yud is supernal wisdom, the, and then you have the supernal He that is supernal understanding. So you have the Yud, and then you have the He. Then you have the Vav, and that is the Ze'iranpin, the six middle Sfirot. And then you have the lower He, which is Olam Asiya, Malchut, the world of action, the physical plane, this is where we are at. So whenever... David says, yeah, we're talking about supernal wisdom, supernal understanding. I point to there because it's in, that's how I see it in my head. Okay, so when Moses called a thousand from each tribe, a thousand from each tribe, there were, in fact, 12,000 down here. But joining with them were 12,000 up there as well. See? Beautiful. To show us that not only were the Midianites to be eradicated in this world, but they had no place in the world to come. Right? Because Midian also has, Midian was a nation, is a nation. And they also have their guardian angel. You have to take them out down here, but first you got to take their guardian angel out up there. 
Once their angel is done, down here they have a no future. That's exactly case in point, for instance, with David and Goliath. David was the, uh, is the sphera of Malchut, kingship, right? Down here in this plane. Why did he keep on referring to Goliath as the uncircumcised Philistine? Because Goliath was literally, it says the Ola, the foreskin that was covering Yesod. What is Yesod? Yesod is the Brit. That's where we have the Brit. We are commanded to remove the foreskin because it is the greatest impurity in this world. And so he was the cover over there. But when David came and saying, how come this uncircumcised Philistine thinks that he can curse the uh, the Malachot uh, Israel, the, um, uh, the, the legions of the God of Israel? Are you crazy? And so David already saw that Goliath was cut off up there. And that's why down here, David's like, dude, you are nothing. I'm going to take a rock. I'm going to throw it in your forehead. You're already wearing a helmet, but don't even worry about that. So that's how these things work. But obviously, everything has to be aroused from down here. We have to do what we need to do down here. Then up there, it goes down here, up there. Now just finish the job. Okay, so... To show us that only uh, there were only the um, the Midianites were st uh, supposed to be eradicated from this world and the next, that's how we see the 24,000, 12 and 12, up, down. So Moses took a thousand men from each and every tribe, so there were 12,000, and he placed the zealous one to be a prince over them. Who was the zealous one? Remember when this is taking place, right? This, of course, was Pinchas. And since he started this ordeal of vengeance, he was responsible for finishing it because it was at hand. Okay, hey, you started it? Great. Take that zeal. Mm. Focus it where it needs to go. As it says in Numbers 31.6, Moses sent them the thousand from each tribe to the army, them along with Pinchas, the son of Eleazar, the Kohen, to the army with the sacred utensils and the trumpets for sounding in his possession. He was leading the charge. Now, Pinchas was very unique in the fact that he was the only priest that was anointed for war. We know that the Kohanim were not allowed to actually fight, right? Because they were not... <coughs> Every soldier that went out had to be anointed for war, and all the Kohanim got anointed for the priesthood. Very, very separate jobs. Even though the Kohanim did go out to battle, they didn't fight, of course. They were the ones that gave strength and focus to Israel around them. But Pinchas was not one of the original four who received this. Uh, the original five, excuse me. It's Aaron and his four sons, now Aaron and his two sons, Aaron's gone, two sons, Elazar and Tamar, were left. So he was anointed for war like the rest of Israel. He actually went out to battle. But since he saved the day, and quite literally Israel and the world, it was God who added him to the list of anointed Kohanim, thereby making him the first and the only battle-ready Kohen among Israel. And it was he who commanded the military charge. Now, remember, the moment he became anointed as a Kohen, that was what applied. He wasn't allowed to go killing anybody, getting blood on himself. Not at all. But he had those that duality over there. So it was, I thought that was really cool. Anyway, so there's another mention of this in First Chronicles 9.20. And Pinchas, the son of Eleazar, was the ruler over them in, in time past, the Lord being with him. So in other words, this is referring to going out to this battle right now. So we're continuing from our text. And they took the holy vessels with them and the trumpets in their hands. So what are the vessels? Always, almost always, they took out the ark with them, right? <clears throat> it was carried by the Kohanim at this time, while Pinchas was dressed in his priestly garb. Now try and picture this, okay? You have the ark of the covenant, and that always led the way, exploding with like electromagnetic energy and blinding light. I mean, it sent, it sent, it said all the, um, the snakes and scorpions, it not only cleared the desert with any kind of mezikim, any of the uh, harmful, creepy crawlies, but it took down mountains that when they were walking through the desert, and again, there are deserts that are flat, but we know, we've learned from the Midrash that wherever Israel sat, there was any there was not even a speck or a grain of sand. So the mountains were flattened, all the rocks were cleared out, and it was a smooth, paved way for them. And this was because of Avon the Ark of the Covenant. 
So you have the Ark of the Covenant leading the charge over there with this incredible light and incredible energy coming out. Behind it, you have Pinchas dressed to the nines with blue and white and silver and gold, full breastplate with the Urim and Atumim inside, right? Given the fact that God already blessed him with peace and eternal life, you know this dude was emanating his own light as well. Then you had the Levites in a row behind him blowing the shofars and the trumpets for battle. Every blast of the shofar broke another impure klipa in the heavens, thereby weakening the entire nation of Midian. And of course, 12,000 pure and holy men of Israel. You need to understand who went out to battle back in the day. It wasn't the big, strong dudes. Every, these people were tzaddikim, the rabbis, the guys that would sit and study all day long because you go out to battle, nothing is going to happen to you. They weren't like, yeah, I'm angry, I'm going to kill. They, they were not, they didn't have bloodlust. They were not bloodthirsty. They were like, this is what God says, and so this is what they're going to do. And they were happy to do it because God said so, all right? So you got the 12,000 pure and holy men of Israel representing the 12 holy tribes of God, marching side by side, shoulder to shoulder, gleaming with their own light. Each tribe had its banner and color shown on the breastplate of Pinchas, which was absolutely shining. They didn't mix their ranks. Again, God, everything that God does is in order. It was like a grid. And above all of them, of course, above this incredible, very impressive display of light and, and strength and power, covering, protecting them was the Holy Shekhinah. God could have destroyed the Midianites himself, right? So why all this? Why all the display? Why tell Israel to take up arms and to do it? What did we just say before? Because it was an extra mitzvah for them. God said so. God gave them that command. God said so. Let's go do it. Take vengeance for the sake of their brethren. And of course, to obey God's commands in the process. And Again, God is not going to fight our battles for us. We have to do it. If, once we do it, God will assist, of course, but we still have to take up arms, you see. What a sight that must have been, though. So the enemy, we know, they never stood a chance. And so they went out and this, they destroyed them, killing every male. But there was a problem. And they went and returned and they brought the daughters of Midian with them. Whoa. Whoa. Now, this is indeed a problem. Did they forget who caused the 24,000 of Israel to fall? So how could this mix-up have happened? There is a reason this was in the Torah. There are no mistakes there, of course, but everything is for us to learn from. So we clearly have rules of engagement and specific commandments when it comes to going out to war. From Deuteronomy 20, for instance, when you go out to war against your enemies and you see horse and chariot of people more numerous than you, you must not be afraid of them. By the way, here is a direct command from God. When you're going out to war against an army that is greater than you, stronger, greater, more numerous, you must not be afraid of them. Lo tiramahem. This is a command in the Torah. Don't you dare be afraid. Why? For God, your God, not their God your God, who brought you up out of Egypt is with you. Remember all that stuff in Egypt? Remember what he did to the most powerful nation on the, in the world? Turned them into nothing, right? Same God, okay? Don't be afraid of them. This is a command. So there are two types of wars or battles. There's a milchemet mitzvah, a mitzvah is a command, right? <coughs> Commanded battles, which fall under God's specific commands to destroy all the inhabitants of the land of Canaan in order to cleanse the land. The fighting and destroying of Amalek, of course. God said, remove their memory, every last one of them. Or if you're going to go out and defend Israel from incoming enemies, right? These are all milchamot mitzvah. You have to go fight otherwise. And again, God could do all this, but it's not a, God wants to see us doing it, helping us, helping him in that sense. In other words, listen, I want to give you this mitzvah, go do it. It's another mitzvah that God gave. So, for instance, Joshua and his battle, so, uh, sorry, in, in order for this milchemet uh, mitzvah, it can only be given by a king. That's also another distinction. Or the anointed ruler at the time. They're the only ones that could say, okay, sign off. 
Milchemet Mitzvah. So when we went back to Joshua, Joshua wasn't a king, although he was acting like a king, just like Moses. And his battle against the 31 Amorite kings once they entered into the land of Israel. In this war, every abled body from age 20 and up went out to war. The other type of war is called Milchemet Reshut. Reshut is optional, right? You can or you cannot. And that order can be given by the Sanhedrin. Um, these would be, let's say, smaller skirmishes, particularly aimed at expanding the borders of Israel to which not everyone has to go out. And there are different criteria for that one. For instance, a person who gets married within the first year of his marriage is not allowed to go out to a milchemet reshut because there's not um, there's not a, a, a chance of annihilation or extinction extinction extinction. You're not defending your country. You're uh, you're widening its borders because let's say you see, hold on, they're building up over there. A conflict is coming. It's kind of like a preemptive strike, if you will. It never just go killing people for no good reason. You're doing it always for the safety of Israel. So a person who gets married that first year, you have to absolutely be with your wife. And then after that year, you can go out to Milchemet Rashut. But if there's an ex existential crisis and there's a Milchemet Mitzvah, of course, everybody goes out to war. And there's a lot of different halachot about how to do this. Now, if we keep reading the laws of Deuteronomy chapter 20, we'll see that they got some of these commands confused. Chapter uh, verse 10, if you approach a city to wage war against it, case in point, right? If you approach a city to wage war against it, you must propose peace to it. We always start with peace. You always get that option. Always. Hey, listen, we don't want to fight, but here's what needs to happen. If it responds to you with peace and opens up its gates to you, all the people found therein must become tributary to you and serve you. In other words, they are going to be your servants. It's either that or death. But we know, as we can learn, that we treat even those who we call our slaves very, very well. By Torah law, you must, okay? There is no abuse. They get to live among Israel, in the land of Israel, to receive all the blessings through Israel. All the commands that are given to Israel, it says, and the gel that lives with you over there, it applies to them as well. They all of a sudden become blessed. Remember, Nimrod gave his own son, Eliezer, to Abraham as a servant. Nimrod was the king of the world. He gave his son to be a servant to this guy. And Pharaoh, later on, gave his daughter, Hagar, as a handmaid. They both said, it is better to be a servant, a slave, in this guy's house, than to be a king or a queen anywhere else in the world. There's a reason for this. Let's go on reading. If it does not make peace with you, send them humanitarian aid. Give them fuel and electricity, running water, and everything else that they might need to prolong the conflict whilst they continue to keep your sons and your daughters in pits and subhuman conditions, beating them, raping them, and torturing them. Oh, sorry, I was reading the Sitra Achos playbook. <laughs> it's confusing. What does God say? If it does not make peace with you and wages war against you, you must besiege it. God your God will deliver it into your hands and you must kill all its males by the sword. However, the women, the children, the animals, and everything that is in the city, all its spoils you may take for yourself and you will consume the spoils of your enemies that God, your God, will have given you. Is this give peace a chance scenario? Is this for the nations who are within the borders of Israel or outside its borders for the sake of the expansion of the kingdom to try and minimize an unnecessarily conflict, unnecessary conflict later on? We don't have to guess. God tells us the answer in the very next verse, right? There's two kinds of wars. You must do likewise to all the cities that are very distant from you, which are not one of the cities of these nations. But what are those nations? What about the nations within your border? It is only with regard to any of the cities of these people which God, your God, is, keep on saying, God, your God, don't forget, which God, your God, is giving to you as an inheritance that you must not allow 
any soul to live. You kill every last one within the borders. Thus saith the Lord. So why was there confusion amongst the people? All this is to prove a point. What happened over here with Midian? Moses said, take them out. They killed all the males, but they brought back the women. What do we see? We see that, in fact, that was a thing because it was from the borders outside of Israel. Where was Midian? Outside of the borders of Israel. <coughs> so why was there confusion, uh, confusion among the people when they went out to battle and killed all the males but left the females? Because Midian, like we said, was not on the list of nations to destroy. Not originally, anyway. For they were not in the borders of Israel. It's very simple. But because they caused the children of Israel to sin in such a disgusting manner, and 24,000 of them lost their lives. God told Moses immediately to wipe them off the face of the earth. So when we read, and when they, uh, and they went and returned, they brought the daughters of Midian with them, we can understand why Moses was furious. When he heard about it and came to them, and he saw them, what is going on here right now? They're like, but it's halacha. Okay, well, we got to clarify halacha. He said, it is because of them, them, all these right here, that the 24,000 of Israel fell. As said in Numbers 31, 16, they were the same ones who were involved with the children of Israel on Bilam's advice to betray the Lord over the incident of Peor, we discussed this a few classes ago, resulting in a plague among the congregation of the Lord. It was them, you're holding them right now. These are them, they're all guilty. Moses became angry with them, as said in verse 14. Moses became angry with the officers of the army, the commanders and the thousands of the commanders of the hundreds who had returned from the campaign of war. And when he became angry, what does our text say? Racha Kodesh left him. From here we learn that a strict man loses his wisdom. So first, okay. This is a bit puzzling since this is Moses, of course, and so we judge him very, very, very favorably since he holds many of the number one spots according to God himself. He always gets a benefit of the doubt. Ruach HaKodesh leaving Moses may have been something that happened momentarily. We're talking about for a split second here. That's it. And not indefinitely, as some people might be thinking. As we can see from a few short verses later, once Israel was reset on the right path, in verse 25, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, it was right there, okay? If the Ruach HaKodesh is not with you, then by default, God does not speak to you. That's your like most basic connection. That's your dial tone right there. So why did Moses get angry? There is no question that it was not for his own sake. How does this chapter start? The Lord spoke to Moses saying, take revenge for the children of Israel against the Midianites. Afterwards, you will be gathered to your people. He was angry with the 12,000 men of war that they did not take vengeance upon the women who caused their brethren to sin. And it was God that says, go take out the Midianites, not males. Take them all. Get rid of them. So he was upset with them that they didn't kill the women who caused their brethren to sin, caused all this plague, caused a terrible chilul Hashem, what they did with Baal Peor. Again, watch those classes. Causing 24,000 of them to die and invoking Zimri to do what he did, which almost resulted in a complete annihilation of them all. This is a big deal. Again, they were not on the list of nations to be taken out, but because of what they did, God said, yeah. So since both men and women were complicit here, they both had to be taken out as God told them to do. So was Moses angry for his own sake? Absolutely not. Not only that, but there was also another way to prove this. <clears throat> and I say this because, <sighs> goodness, I, I just so happened, like while I'm writing this, I just so happened to hear such a dumb argument about this topic, obviously, this is not from Torah Jews, but, you know, the people who believe they know what, they, what they're talking about, regarding this whole thing. So let's set the record straight, yet again, from the simple text, even in English. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, God said to Moses, here is your command, take revenge for the children of Israel against the Midianites. In other words, everybody that was complicit, and that is male and female, you will take revenge upon them. What do you think you're going to do? Not slap them, yeah, kill them. Afterwards, you will be gathered to your people. 
Do you understand? I don't think you understand. So let's translate this properly. As soon as you are done, Moses, God says to Moses, as soon as you are done with the task of removing the Midianites from existence, you're dead. Right? No argument, even in the English. And we know for a fact that Moses did not want to die. There's an entire conversation within the Pshat, the Remez, the Drash, and the Sod regarding this. We gave classes on this. All that Moses, I just don't, I don't want to die. Let me go into the land of Israel. You're not going to go in the land of Israel. Fine. Turn me into a beast of the field. Turn me into a bird of the air. But I don't want to die. I want to, I want to still bask in your light in this world. Because he knew that so long as we are alive, we can still do commands. In whatever form, right? I'm not talking about an animal form. But he said, I just, I want to be here. I don't want to go, right? Again, watch those classes. So you tell me, for a person who knows that the moment they complete this one last task is going to end their life, would they run to do it and then get upset when it wasn't completed? You understand the point that I'm making here? Most of us would have dragged our feet, but not Moses. This is one of the reasons that Joshua lived till 110 years instead of 120 years like Moses. God told him the same thing. The moment that you kill the 31 Amorite kings and their armies, you're dead. He dragged his feet because who in their right? Okay, yeah, well, let us let me think about this military campaign. Immediately, Moses said, get him out there. Next verse, go gather the thing. You got the 12,000. God said, do this and you're dead. God said it. He didn't care what happens to him. It's never about Moses. It was always about God and Israel. So, because Joshua dragged his feet, and he did destroy the 31 Amorite kings, God took off 10 years from his life. So again, I ask you, was Moses angry for his own sake? Absolutely not. And anyone who says different clearly did not read or understand the simple text, even in English. Because it even continues in the chapter, and we'll get into that in a moment. So let's keep reading from our text here, Pirkei Durab Eliezer. He called Eleazar who received it after him. That's what it says. Karal Eleazar. Who called to Eleazar to receive what after who? God called to Eleazar to execute the commands that Moses got angry about. Go kill the women who were responsible for this mess. And why did God call to Eleazar? For that one moment that Moses got angry, he could not hear God. In other words, it was just shut for a moment. God gave, he gave it to Moses. Everything, all the prophecy that came in that camp, everything came from Moses, right? I will increase the Ruach upon you, and then all the other guys are going to start prophesying. Moses was their conduit wherever he went. So that faucet was closed for a split second, and then it went to the next guy in line. It went to Eleazar. As said in verse 21, Elazar the Kohen said to the soldiers, returning from battle, this is the statute that the Lord commanded Moses. In other words, okay, go out, go kill the women now. <clears throat> this is what God commands to Moses. He was confirming it, confirming that God indeed commanded this to Moses. And our text ends with Elazar saying, as God commanded Moses, not me. You see, but Moses got angry for that split second, so he didn't hear this, so I heard it. And yes, I'm confirming, in fact, God told it to him. I heard God speaking to Mo, and now this is what needs to take place. So again, confirming yet again that all this command came directly from God. So, two things we can take away from this. I say two, but there is actually three. The first, so long as we live according to the nations, when it comes to all matters... Everything, big or small, including and especially war, kidnapping, besieging, and what have you, we will falter just like the nations will, if we live according to the nations. And we are, we do. The second, do not question Mo uh, Moses' motivation ever, because the proof is always in the text itself. It's right there. It's very simple. You just need to read it. And third... When it comes to us, see, we have to take this on a 
big scale and then we also have to apply it to our lives. When it comes to us, ourselves, and the terrorists that we harbor within us, those, the, the evil inclination, the sitra akhra, as we are killing it, as we are winning, it will beg for humanitarian aid. Don't be stupid. Not like those in charge of our lives here. No. We do not show mercy to the merciless. We do not prolong conflicts that can end swiftly. And we certainly do not negotiate with terrorists. And that's our class for the day. Now, these next few days should be an interesting time. Ahead of us, we are going into Hoshana Rabbah and Simchat Torah. <coughs> very, very auspicious times, as we can see from the last year. <sighs> Let's wait and see what happens. If you have any questions regarding anything, okay, but something you'd actually like an answer to, I will answer you via email. So send me that. Only serious inquiries, please. So as always, thank you for joining me. Have a Chag Sameach, have a wonderful rest of the week, and have a Shabbat Shalom. Bye-bye.